Technology is often promoted as though it will make life better and easier. As an IT professional, many of my colleagues speak highly of the great cost savings that computer solutions bring. This seems to be true on a small scale, but if you're like me, you wonder if modern life full of its high-tech marvels is as labour-free as promised. To me, it seems the more we innovate, the busier we become. This seems counterintuitive. Technology does bring a sense of accomplishment and potentially reduces waste. But it seems to also bring some sad circumstances, like job loss due to automation, or contemporary consumerism with associated environmental impact. This video has a wide target audience. It's adapted from an essay at Dunconomics.blog. Head there for footnotes. If you are disgusted by the modern disposable technological trends and you often think about leaving the rat race to raise grass-fed cows, listen on. You may be surprised to learn how a current top-down economic system is causing this unsustainable madness and how to solve it. Or if you're a business owner who lives comfortably in a high-rise penthouse, continue listening to hear how much of your wealth is being stolen. Or maybe you're a decade away from retirement, but you struggle to keep up with these new computer contraptions at work. You wonder why things can't be like the good old days of pen and paper. What follows is a broad lay perspective on what I think is a profound tragedy regarding the relationship between economics and technology. I live in Australia, but all concepts are applicable to any nation. I'll try to be brief with the following economics primer. Try to stay awake so the main point makes sense. If you keep up with the news, you probably hear that most governments try to regulate inflation at 2 to 3%. The term inflation is used in its common utility meaning, the rise in cost of living. It means your money won't buy as much stuff and things will generally cost more over time. For example, a loaf of bread may have cost $3 last year compared to $3.10 today. But if you get paid more, that shouldn't be a big deal, right? That's the idea. To calculate the cost of living, real product and service prices are recorded and indexed. The most common index is the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. This is what's quoted mostly in the news. Governments gather thousands of consumer prices and compare them with previous periods. Governments encourage these prices by manipulating an economy with a central bank. While the term bank is accurate, in the context of this video, you only need to think of it as an entity that creates the national currency, or money. The main way the central bank increases the cost of living is by continuing to print the currency. Nowadays this is done digitally, but it's conceptually the same. The bank is the issuer so they can make as much as they want. By printing more dollars, yen or euro, the currency is not as rare and therefore becomes less valuable. This is the literal meaning of inflation in economic terms. Money is valuable because it's rare. The more money that is available, the less valuable it will become. Much economic study aims to predict this relationship between money supply and the rising cost of living. This is because the relationship is organic and somewhat unpredictable. Economists must consider how fast people are spending and even what people feel something's worth from a historical context. This is why real prices are used to calculate CPI. Let's summarise this axiom as creating money increases the cost of living. Now, before I send you to sleep, it gets interesting. One day the following thought struck me. Printing money increases the cost of living, while technology integrators, such as myself, are reducing the cost of living by helping businesses cut costs. Potentially, they could cancel each other out. To clarify, when costs are rising, businesses often reduce costs using technology. IT professionals, engineers, are among other jobs that frequently aim to save businesses money. Let me give you a few examples. Installing a computer program that helps a small business to spend less money on bookkeeping fees. A hired accountant now spends half the time as invoices can be sent via email. Or an automotive manufacturer installs a robot welder which increases the speed of production. Even this example results in decreased costs because there's less labour required per vehicle. 
or a food producer decides to use a new preservative for transport. This allows food to be shipped further to gain customers and reduce expiring food. In theory, on a national scale, these technological changes would have a deflationary impact on the cost of living. In essence, technology is pushing the cost of living down. Let's summarize this axiom as, technology decreases the cost of living. Sometimes process improvements only have a positive impact, such as changing a manufacturing procedure to produce more with fewer resources. On the other hand, a food producer may discover that their preservative are potentially harmful and render food less nutritious. Overall, I propose this at best increases our dependence on technology and at worst leads to a gradual lower quality of products. When a central bank inflates the currency, encouraging price increases, the market is absorbing much of the cost through technology. This diagram may help to describe this hidden cost of inflation. It's a comparison between the cost of living and money supply. It seems logical that an increase in money would proportionally increase the cost of living. But as you can see, the cost of living is measuring far lower than the accelerating inflation. Our current dependency on technology explains this discrepancy. Simply stated, technology is absorbing much of the cost of inflation. Dependency on tech is perpetuated when central banks continue to use CPI in monetary policy decisions. When technology reduces costs for population, a central bank will usually inflate the currency via money printing or interest rate changes, compounding the problem. But what does this all mean? Well, let's think of our three hypothetical characters. First, the organic loving hippie. Organic farming has a specific definition, but perhaps it can be summarized by a general rejection of technology for food production. If we didn't have accelerating inflation, I suspect more people would favor organic farming. Sure, many would still offer our current conventional food supplies, especially those escaping poverty, but with a lower cost of living, families would have more leftover wealth, which could be used for more expensive food options. This is in contrast with their current sad reality that consuming a purely organic diet is generally available only to the wealthy. Putting the debate of organic benefit aside, consumers should be free to choose this option given that it was once the only option before the Industrial Revolution. So if we want to see a greener world, we should be advocating to free our second hypothetical character, the business owner, from the shackles of modern central banking. If the entrepreneur doesn't have to worry about a perpetual increase in costs, they'll have less reason to reduce quality or implement technology as band-aid fixes. As another example, imagine how cheaper labour caused by a lower cost of living would encourage waste recyclers to compete with big mining multinationals, selling metals and other raw materials. With less dependency on technology, we can see that there would be less need to get with the times, more emphasis on experience and labour, less on change and improvement, which is good news for a hypothetical retiree. Here's a quick one on analysis number four, decay. Um, so when you, you do start jacking up money and credit, um, uh, businesses in particular tend to face three choices. Um, and this is according to Dr. Gary North, who's an economist in, in the US and wrote a book called Honest Money. Um, he says, firstly, businesses have to sell the same goods at the same price um, and get stuck with a now inflating and devaluing currency. Not a great choice. Number two, sell the same good and service at a higher price. But um, unlike people you hear in the media, it sounds like businesses can just pass on the costs and jack up the prices. No, they can't. Unless they're protected like a bank or, or some other industries, you can't just whack your price up because you'll lose sales and lose revenues and profit. So that's not a great choice either. Um, third choice, and this is the, what usually happens, um, more so than the first or the second, is you can sell a lower quality good or service at the same price. And um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that's been happening in Australia, the US, and other places where they've been inflating the money supply. Um, and that it becomes a moral dimension too. You know, you're essentially ripping people off. It's, it's probably legal, but it's not a good thing in your economy. You know, you're going backwards.
or are you or are you certainly stagnant and, and you're not really going anywhere to remove inflation there's a few options the following is not financial advice seek a qualified financial advisor for financial advice for thousands of years gold has served as money and continues to be used in the finance industry Precious metals such as gold and silver have a natural low inflation rate and can't be easily manipulated. The key distinction is that they must be physically mined. Governments are forced to tax the normal way. Unfortunately, in many countries, gold and silver can't be used as legal tender. Trading in precious metals might sound primitive, but remember people wouldn't have to carry around heavy coin bags. Banks still could provide internet banking and overnight settlements as our current system allows. In some countries like Australia, coins in gold and silver are available, so the system's already in place for the population to use it. Another option is for governments to issue precious metals for currency. This was once common practice, but unfortunately in most instances, the coins were devalued using techniques such as mixing other metals, this is no coincidence. Just like any business or individual, if a government can find a way to spend more than it makes, with no consequence, the temptation is too great to resist. Recently, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin have been making news headlines. These currencies are completely virtual, existing only in a computer database. What makes them special is that they are decentralized in that a copy of the database is duplicated to a community of computers that no single entity can easily manipulate. This is why they appeal to so many investors because in theory, the investment won't devalue in the long run. Most of these digital currencies have a commitment to little or no inflation. Lastly, we could repeal legal tender laws and other laws to allow businesses and individuals to choose. For example, capital gains tax. Multiple competing currencies may arise for specific purposes. For example, cryptocurrency for international trade and precious metals for local communities. Businesses don't really want inflation, so freedom of choice would help. Well, except for banks, inflation props up their assets. Observe that there's no need for more regulation, rather more freedom of choice of money. Inflation causes more reliance on technology and makes manual labour less competitive. With stable money, technology will be less about survival and more about helping people. I encourage you to ponder this economic theory as you buy your groceries and use computers at work. Realising this should help you remove guilt from using technology, yet help you understand and empathise with those struggling to keep up with it. Technology frequently saves lives and helps people escape poverty, so we should be grateful for it. Tech isn't inherently evil, but as we can see, external manipulation of money is the chief cause of gloomy situations of which technology and business is often centre stage. To bring about lasting positive change, we should look to the real cause, monetary inflation. Restructuring national economic policy is a momental task. My hope is that this video can increase awareness and discussion. Feel free to help by sharing. Thanks.